as we return to this portion of chapter of Judges 16. Hello and good morning. Shall we thank our Heavenly Father for this opportunity that we have to get together? Shall we praise him for his loving kindness and ask for his wisdom so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that we are about to read and examine within this portion of the chapter? Shall we pray? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together to learn to discuss, to consider the examples that are now before us. We ask that your spirit may guide us, that your wisdom may be upon us, that we may be able to address that which helps to build your character within us. We have great need of you, Father. We thank you for these opportunities. We thank you for the time that you are presenting. Guide us now, be with us, show us that which you would have us to do. May your will be done. May your character be shown to all that we come in contact with. Now and always in Jesus name, amen. Okay, in the moral story, the hair on Samson's head was a symbol of his allegiance to God. In the figurative story, in the upside down consideration that we've had, does this hair mean something else? Do we have another reason another symbol that we have yet to address. Okay, so we had addressed that the symbol is, is the 2520 because of the seven locks, right, the seven times. But you're saying you, you want some other symbol? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking, so we set the table for what we're about to go through today. Yeah, because when the hair on his head begins to grow again, um, would, would we would we all be in agreement then that when the hair on his head begins to grow again, that this is akin to the rediscovery of the importance of the 2520? Mm -hmm. And a development of it as well. Okay. So it's not just that we're understanding something. Something is happening in regard to it. That's why we're understanding it. Because we only understand prophecy as we pass through it. Now, is this with the hair on the head beginning to grow again? We, <clears throat> I think we can be agreed that it is not likely that this was again put into seven locks. This is like a message that springs up in power in many different forms in many different ways because once you shave your head you don't have it growing long enough to become locks but it's very evident <clears throat> that the hair is growing So if this is the message of the seven times, and I don't disagree with that, it's a message that is going all over because it's going all over his head, right? Any difference of opinion on this? 
Any other thoughts? So, um, so it's growing all over because it's all over his head. Well, I'm just <clears throat> as an example. Hair does not grow naturally into braids or locks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying. I, I don't know if I would say that it's that it's the understanding is growing all over. I, I, I don't know, that doesn't, I, I don't Do we, see a symbol for that. Okay, I what I'm looking at, it, Theodore, is this. The understanding that we've had upon the seven times, especially after July 18th, has not been something that one party or two parties has been promoting. We're finding points about the seven times coming from all over the world right now. <clears throat> We're finding contributions as to the importance of the seven times that are adding to our understanding. And as they add to our understanding, they also add to our strength as to why the seven times is important. Would you have a problem with that? And um, Ezekiel chapter five, we have we have hair representing people. Okay. So I'm just thinking with the, uh, the four stories that we have with, uh, we, we can maybe tie them, tie them into being the first, second, the third angel, and then the, the fourth angel uh, or the second angel being repeated. Right. In the time, in the time when uh, Samson um, loses his hair in a sense, and my thoughts go to the, the railroad vision that Ellen White had in Loma Linda. Right. <clears throat> where she sees, she sees like the, the church basically like decimated. In a sense, that's the, the people, she's, she's basically she's looking at the church, there's basically no one's there. We've all capitulated, is what it seems. But then she talks about it gradually, people then. Uh, that's so she compares that to the Sunday law, and and then so then people then uh, reemerge, and the sense that's maybe like the hair growing again. So that's just a thought I have. Excellent point. Yeah, um, yeah, because in in Ezekiel chapter five, he's he's scattering this hair, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. So this relates to the. Uh, the time of Babylon in 586, which we could typify as being Sunday law. But could we also, is this analogous to the spreading of seed as well? Uh, no, the scattering of the hair? Yeah, the scattering no. of the hair. Well, I mean, if you take them as going, being scattered among the nations as seed, um, I guess. But uh, that's not what we understood when we under, when he studied Ezekiel 5. Because um, that was them going into captivity. Right. <clears throat> so there was the, a third part was uh, destroyed in the, in the siege. And the third part was scattered um, um, uh, with the wind. Another part was uh, uh, they would smite it about with a knife. So there'd be a type of persecution. And the ones that are scattered to the wind, he would draw out a sword after them. 
and thou shalt take thereof a few of number and bind them in thy skirts, right? So that's going to represent the remnant that return. So um, here, I think the growing of the head would be more like the remnant that returned. Right, this is a restoration of the message. And, and it is in verse 22. Right. So, Which makes it an interesting symbol. Yeah. So, so my understanding is that, that what we see is that the message is going to be restored after its decimation, right? Right. Um, so, I mean, there's an understanding of this message. But, and obviously this message is going to be proclaimed. So... And now in the moral story, as we talked about yesterday, so in the moral story, we can see that the positive elements, we don't turn on their head when we look at the symbolic story. So we don't say, well, we take these things and, and make them a negative in the symbolic story. It, it, and what we have is sort of this parallel track, though. We have uh, the moral lessons which this message is supposed to heed, um, it's a warning to this movement, uh, but we also have the symbolic message, which is really about the ultimate victory of this message. And and in in the moral story, there's the victory of the message as well, though in a sort of um, a negative sense. I mean, Samson kills himself. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice for they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. So they're looking that they need to pay homage to Dagon. They are ascribing to Dagon great power. They are saying that Dagon through the use of bribery, through the use of a lewd woman, an impure woman, has delivered Samson and made him <clears throat> our prisoner. How will we turn this on its head? I don't think we turn this part of the story on its head. I don't think the death of Samson is going to be turned okay, on. Okay, so this is okay. How do we look at this verse preceding the death of Samson in a symbolic manner? Well, this must represent the Sunday law. And and this is a different section. Right. So we, we treat it differently. There's something about this section that, that is different than the rest because it's going to be Samson's victory. Um, so I don't think we would turn this one on its head. At least I can't see how we can. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any symbols that we can take from this verse? I mean, so let, let's say we were going to first, let, let's just examine this a little bit more. So if we were going to turn this on its head, all of these things would have to be positive, right? Dagon would have to rep represent something good. Which right? it doesn't. Which it doesn't as, as a symbol. 
So, so now we have, um, but if we were going to turn on its head, it would have to represent, you know, Christ or something like that, right? Which I don't know how we could do that with this part of this story. I mean, maybe we can, but we've taken all this other story uh, ironically. But now when we get here, it seems to me that we can't. But, you know, what would be the basis of not taking it ironically if we've been doing that all through this whole part of the story? And I'm not saying I'm right here. I'm just saying, you know, you would have to take the lords of the Philistines. They would have to represent uh, the wise virgins. Uh, this great sacrifice unto Dagon would have to be a sacrifice unto Christ. This would be, um, you know, that's how we would have to take it. And, and maybe we could. But I don't know. This, this part of the story seems too straightforward um, to do that. Comment from the chat is that we should compare this with Revelation 8 to 10. Why? Well, I'll read the verses to you. It says that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So it's just a sacrilegious celebration at the defeat of you know the Bible, basically, or somebody who was supposed to be representing Christ. So I saw the commonality there. Well, we do have two pillars. Which will yet come up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because I've looked at this death of Samson and I've tried to think how how we could. Like the other ones, ironically, it's quite clear. And maybe there's aspects of this that, because we have the moral story, which is pretty straightforward, I think, here. Um. But as far as symbols here, in so in, in the other verses, we had symbols that were attached to um, like Delilah and so forth that were obviously symbols representing this movement and the message of this movement. But here, I don't see any symbols that do that, at least in this first part. They're ascribing that Dagon delivered Samson into their hands, and they see Samson as their enemy. Mm -hmm. They're not understanding. They're, they're rejecting that they've turned their back on the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I get... I get your point that this can be a type of the Sunday law because the enemy that is before them is the one that they believe has caused their problems. Mm -hmm. They don't look that they themselves have caused their own problems. Um, so, okay, one little point. So we ask for a symbol. Now, um, when it comes to Dagon, Dagon, of course, is the fish god, as we know. Fish and man. Yeah, it's a fish man god, right? Um, now, it comes from the word de gras, uh, which means to multiply or increase. And, and that's the Hebrew number 1711. All right. Now, Dagon itself is 1712. But 1711, the significance of that is um, 
seventeen eleven when we when we look at it as a number um, is uh, what do you get when you multiply seventeen by eleven? Yeah. Yeah, 17 by 11, you get 187, right? Okay. So, so that's, but if we have 1117, um, which is a mirror of that or a reverse of it, I guess, um, that's the 187th prime number. Both symbols pointing to July 18th. Yeah. So, so if we were going to take Dagon here, um, then maybe we could take this as, uh, um, you know, something to do with uh, July 18th. So we do have a symbol that we could attach to it, though it's it's a little bit roundabout. Now, the other thing the fish got, the only thing, you know, pointing to a symbol of Christ is we know that that the fish is used to symbolize Christ. and. And, and the reason has to do with um, uh, the name of Christ, right? That somehow it, I can't remember exactly how that uh, works, but it's, it's in Greek what the word is, but uh, they're taking um, the letters and somehow they're making it into fish. I can't remember how that works, if anybody remembers how. That fish symbol represents Christ. Well, isn't that from the from the instruction that I will make you fishers of men? Yeah. It, okay. So, the, yeah. So it it has to do with uh, um, it's like an acronym or something like that. Because uh, the word fish is ichthys. Um. And I'm just looking it up here. Yeah, the only thing that's not in ichthos is the R. Well, yeah, so ichthos. So what it is is um, it stands, it's an acronym for Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, our Savior. Uh, so Jesus Christos Theo Eos Soter. So that that's the the story. Um, so maybe in a sense, this fish god in an ironic story could represent Christ and also July 18th. And maybe it's the coming together of the character of Christ in this movement. So if, if we were going to look for those symbols, because that's the thing that we did in the other part is we saw the symbols represent our message and so we could do that here but when i was looking at the story before i didn't see that and i couldn't see how we could take this story and turn it ironically but if, if we were going to take this one verse here um so the lords of the Philistines, that's going to be the five wise, right? Right. And they gathered them together, that is themselves together, and, and others, uh, to offer a great sacrifice unto Christ and this understanding that we have of July 18th. Those all come together. And to rejoice, for they said, our God hath delivered Samson, which is this message. Um, now, you wouldn't say um, into the hand of the enemy here, right? I mean, this would be into the hand of, or now Samson being our enemy, Samson wouldn't be the enemy in this case, right? Samson so, would be the message. Yeah into our hand and we have that hand there again which um we had addressed before because of the number symbolizing uh march 27th which is also a symbol of the 27th day of the third month which is 273 that's the message to the levites and so it could represent then uh, the giving of this message to the levites all right
right? right? But that to me, I mean, it, I mean, it's definitely possible. I haven't thought how this relates to the rest of the story, but uh, if we were going to continue what we were doing, so, you know, I would have to backtrack on what I said. But it's hard to do this sometimes, to take this story and turn it on its head. But the entire purpose of, of our meetings has been to give consideration to alternate ideas mm -hmm. and to search out additional representations within this and not just take this for the moral story. Right. Yeah. Now, and of course, the death, death of Samson here, I mean, this would be the death because Samson represents also the 144,000 because it's the message that leads to the 144,000. But if we're going to place this, that Samson is <clears throat> the message, mm -hmm. then is not the death of Samson the completion of the work of Samson? Yes. The completion of the work of the message. Yep. That's what it would have to be. And that completion is the character of Christ in his people. Okay. <clears throat> so, so we would have to look at this death of Samson then as... Um, this wouldn't then be about the Sunday law, you know, in the United States. This would be about the time of Jacob's trouble. This would be about the death decree. This would be about uh, events connected with the close of probation that follow it, the seven last plagues and all those types of things that God's people experience. So this would be, um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right. So this, this would be much more future than just something within our movement. But, but it is, I mean, we, we do recognize that our movement leads to this. Well, the movement has to lead to this. Yeah. <clears throat> is it any different than what Christ understood that his disciples did not understand about the fact that when he last came to Jerusalem, he knew that he was going to the cross. Okay, so let's let's just think for a moment here. I mean, we know we know this movement was led of God, and God has given us a great deal of light, and he's he's brought us through an experience that parallels that of the Millerites. And we, we are on a typical line in which um, the Sunday law has been illustrated by the pandemic and, and the, the separation of the two classes of worshipers has been illustrated. Now, the problem that we have is where do we move from our typical line into the bigger line again? And, and the way that I've understood it is we have a Sunday law that's coming and our line has been a a type of the sunday law but it also leads to the sunday law correct i would have to agree yeah now within the movement we have different ideas of how that's going to occur because i think everyone in the movement would agree that what what our experience is is leading to the sunday law and we have some who would say well this pandemic is the beginning of the sunday law and that the Sunday law is going to involve uh, this pandemic and the Sunday law is going to be immediate. It's, it's going to, um, you know, things have been set up for the Sunday law. And we can all agree that what's happened is definitely um, preparation for the Sunday law. Uh, the destruction of uh, free speech um, and uh, the ability of governments to come in and control what people are thinking, what they are doing, um, that, that's been unprecedented um, in modern times in the United States and Canada, in the Western world, right? Agreed. So we can all, 
Yeah, so we can agree that we're going in that direction. Now, the question is, um, so if we look at the death of Samson, and we say, well, this is talking about events after the close of probation, which if it is, so one of the things we did with this line is we said that this line can represent the first, second angel's message in Millerite history. The third angel's message arriving on October 22nd, 1844, and the subsequent history in the giving of that third angel's message. And come, leading up to the repeat of history, which is, of course, the Sunday law, right? The Sunday law is the fourth angel that empowers the third. And we have understood that oh, recently, at least, that our repeat of history is a zoom in onto the Sunday law. That is, however we look at it, from 1989, the time of the end there, that's not a part of Ellen White's line, right? She has the Sunday law with Revelation 18. But we, we mark, you know, 9-11 is Revelation 18. So we had the first angel's message being repeated in 1989. And then with 9-11 occurring, the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. And, and that's specifically uh, addressing uh, the Sunday law if you're dealing with Revelation 18, because that's what Ellen White uses it for. So now we're in this typical line and we're expecting that we're going to go directly to this Sunday law. Yet we can see that this death of Samson here, that's, that is um, followed by this fourth, right? So this fourth, the one where he gets his head cut off, we would say that's the Sunday law, right? Where he gets his head cut off. Not his head cut off, his hair of his head cut off. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to talk too fast. So he gets the hair of his head shaven. Right. And we would say that that's the fourth, so that must be the Sunday law. But what if it's just a type of the Sunday law? What if it's representing this movement that's a type of the Sunday law? I think it's, I, I would have to agree with you more here, because that being a type of Sunday law makes much more sense. Okay. Just like we look seen in the story of Esther, the story of Esther is a type of the Sunday law, because it doesn't fall in the right place uh, in the story of Esther for it to be the Sunday law itself. That is, within those lines of the, the first decree, the second decree, and the third decree, it occurs in the story of Esther occurs in the second. Right. Right. So um, now the death of Samson here, we could apply typically to this movement. But we would then or, or to this movement, but it would be typical of what's going to happen after the close of probation. Would that be consistent? Because even though we can look at this death of Samson, we can put it on the big line, right? We can say that this is all Ellen White's line, right? The first and third angel's message, the fourth, the Sunday law, and now the death of Samson being the close of probation and 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 the events that, that are connected with that, right? Time of Jacob's trouble, all that. Or we can take this whole story and just zoom it into this movement. Well, having this be a type of one of the Sunday laws, not the final Sunday law, mm -hmm. I think makes much more sense. Because when we're looking at this in the moral story, we have, we hear, here we have Samson, we're, we're looking at this with the, the lords of the Philistines, the five, gathered together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon. So we have leaders that are offering this sacrifice, and then they call the people together. Mm -hmm. Would that be a fair statement from what we're looking at here? Yeah. Now, um, 
it's definitely a fair statement. Um, but we, we can see it as both ways, because obviously the type, since we are a type of the Sunday law, everything this movement experiences is illustrating something on the big line, right? Okay. Right, that's, that's the whole thing of a type. So, but if it's addressing this movement specifically, um, so one of the things we did with Judges chapter two is we'd taken the verses and we had applied them to the years. Right. Right. From 2000 Correct. onward. And I'm not saying that we can do that all the way through this in Judges 16. But we can see it that uh, 1622, howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven, which is a number 22 being the number of restoration. Um, we can see that um, with 621, uh, 620, uh, 1620, 1621, 1619, um, that this could be representing what happened in the movement from 2019 to 2021. Well, okay, numerically. Yeah. How, how would we come to the number 16? Well, 16 is 8 plus 8. 16, if, if we also look at this, is two times two times two times two right yeah so again restoration but i think the 16 here would be the symbols that jeff had uh, dealing with second chronicles chapter 29 where you have eight days cleansing the most holy place and eight days cleansing the holy place for the priests and the levites right so it's 16 days um which is which he had applied to that history from November 9th, uh, originally to July 18th, but we could see it would include um, 2021 as well. So, right. I'm, so I'm saying that that this movement has been the hair of the head has been growing again in 2022 which is the year we're in. But the, the other part, if I was to write this out for 1622, I would have two to the fourth. So a repeat of the four messages of Revelation 14 joined with Revelation 18 mm -hmm. with a message of restoration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So we, we have seen in 2022 a restoration of our understanding of this message. The message has been challenged um, because of basically, you know, the failure of everything that that we had predicted in, in, the, in the sort of literal sense, though we recognize that what's not truly a failure. But okay. as we've been studying, we're, we're having this message restored. It's, it, the hair is growing again. And so we could see that um, 19, 20, and 21 would represent uh, what happened in the movement as far as the failure of the message, if we're taking the moral story to apply to it. Okay, in this, in this situation, the message of July 18th was a warning to Nashville. Mm -hmm. What was another portion that Elder Jeff was very clear about that did not at that time occur? What were you talking about, Islam? No, I'm not talking about Islam at all. Okay. Um, I don't quite understand what you're referring to. But... Did he not, was he not very clear? that Trump or the message of Trump was going to bring forth a civil war. Right. So, so we were expecting, um, so we had the two prophecies basically that were in some ways separate. I mean, we had the Correct. message of Trump and we have the message of July 18 and we, um, so that's why the one group has picked up more, the Trump prediction 
and have tried to reestablish it on a different on different uh, arguments, right? So saying that, that we're, we really were correct about Trump, um, though in a sense saying that we were wrong because if Trump didn't fulfill his role in connection with those lines, uh, then then we were wrong about Trump. Where I'm saying that Trump did fulfill his role. Um, but we were in a typical line and didn't understand what that meant, right? So we were looking for something much more literal, both in the sense of the attack by Islam and also what was going to happen with Trump. Right. So, so in this moral story here, if we take this and we take it and apply it to the message, I mean, this is about the decimation of the message, right? Exactly. Okay. But in 2022, the hair of the head began to grow. And then when we get to 23, we know that Collins' prediction ends on January 11th at midnight, so beginning of January 12th, 2023. Um, even though that he doesn't particularly set that date, his structure creates that date. So we have 2023 as this um, this situation here which would be um taking this story um of dagon this offering in the sacrifice unto dagon and applying it somehow to this movement and how we're going to do that i'm not quite sure well so, so we i have think the we're going to have, have the moral story I think we're going to have to progress through this to see where the bones and the sinews wind up within this story. Mm -hmm. Now, we've established that the five lords of the Philistines gathered themselves together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon. And when the people saw him, when the people saw Samson, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us, or which who multiplied our slain. So, the lords of the Philistines must be calling Samson out of the prison house. Otherwise, the people would not be seeing him. Mm -hmm. So the lords of the Philistines are calling forth the message. Okay, so, so let's go back to, um, so we, we have some symbols here. And, and again, we're doing these, these symbols are, are rather, uh, for some people, they'd be rather obscure in the sense that we're using the Hebrew numbers. But this, uh, if we go back to verse 23, right. um, we have gathered them together. So Strong's numbers there is 622 which we know is a symbol for FFA. Okay. Right? And it's a symbol for FFA because that's June 22nd. It's the date that Jeff chose in uh, 2000 and, um, 2011, 2014. And it also becomes the center of the 777 chiasm in 2017. And it also becomes the date that we have... Um, the message of July 18, go to the world in 2020, right? Okay. So it's marked every three years. Um, and so this, this gathering them together with this number 622, I mean, would this represent a gathering together of the message of FFA or the people even of FFA? Would this show uh, a union? Uh, because we've already sort of said that that's what's going to happen in 2023. 
that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. So the Lords of the Philistines bringing forth Samson and in bringing forth the message and then the people of FFA coming in union, but are they coming in, in union to praise the message or condemn the message? Well, it would be to praise. So, so we're, um, I know it's, it's difficult running these two stories parallel to each other, but we're, when we're dealing with the symbols themselves, we're dealing with the symbols, we're taking the ironic story, right? We turn Philistines into good things, right? Dagon into a good thing, etc. When we're dealing with the moral story, we don't do that. When we deal with the moral story, we're just looking at it without the symbols themselves. It is, um, doesn't mean that we don't use any symbols, but we don't look at Samson in the moral story as representing um, the good part of the movement. We could use it to represent those who have rejected the message because these are those that are going to, in a sense, fail. But then we have, we have problems still, which have been pointed out, you know, He's going to be victorious, but it's going to be with his death. And of course, that could typify Christ, right? Because Christ gave up his life freely. But here, Samson is not, um, he's, he's not really giving up his life freely in the sense that he's a slave, he's blind, and it's, it's more like a desperate attempt to just take as many down with him as he can. He's more like a suicide bomber or, or a kamikaze. And Christ, we couldn't compare to a suicide bomber or a kamikaze. Right? Right. So, so I mean, that's, that's the problem that we have to sort out in our head as we move through this story. Um, but, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back to, to one of the points that you were making just a moment ago. If we look at the Strong's numbers, when we get into verse 16, 24, they are praising Dagon, and they have said, our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy. Now, the Strong's number for hands here is 3027. Mm -hmm. And we keep having that hand show up. Right. Right. It shows up enemy into our hands, delivered into our hands. It's about the money in their hands. Right. Um, and the other one was, uh, I can't remember. There was another one where we had hand. Um, anyway. It, yeah. So it's shown up again and again. So is this, is this our numerical representation then of the Levites? Right. That's what it seems to be. So if we take the this story, I mean, this is this is about the giving of the message to the Levites by this movement. Okay. So so let's look at it this way. So we have twenty twenty three. Um, so in 2023, we see that this movement is gathered together. That's what we're taking. That's the wise, the lords of the Philistines, the five, five wise. They're gathered together. So something happens in this movement that unites us. And, and part of it would be the failure of, of the Trump prediction. And, and this would have to be pretty devastating for people, too. That is, they would have to see it. Um, but then... When the people saw him, that's going to be Samson, right? Right. Um, because he's delivered to the Levites. This is a message that's given to the Levites. They're going to to praise him, right? Or and the question is, are they praising him or are they condemning him? Right. That's kind of the question you had. Because how do we look at this story? Correct. Right. Um, and, and so that's part of the problem that we're having. We're trying to decide where do we go ironically, where do we go 
positively. But I, I've said that the negative things have to be turned to positive, but that the positive things remain positive. That is, if you um, add two positive numbers, you get a positive. If you add a positive and a negative, or multiply, I should say, multiply a positive and a negative, you get a negative, right? Right. So, so in this case, we would have um, the positives are still positive. So that this would be a, a proclamation of the message to the Levites that they're going to accept. Okay. Now, in this verse, 1624, mm -hmm. the reference that the translators used to support what they're talking about here would take us to Daniel 5.4, which reads, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Mm -hmm. Here we have the impious feast of Belshazzar. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Yeah. So that, yeah. So on the moral story, when you just look at the moral story, obviously it's pagan worship. But we've taken this moral story and we've turned it on its head. But I've said that the positive things are still positive. Right. Right. So then praising God, uh, this is the true God, right? Right. Because of this message, um, we wouldn't we wouldn't look at them as, you know, mocking God or something because of the giving of this message. This has to be a positive message. They've set aside their idolatry. Yeah. So so it's what we've been saying already. If we take it that way. Now, and, and then it talks about the destroyer of our country. Now, the country here is just the Hebrew word, Eretz, which means land, right? Um, but, you know, we've been looking at the Hebrew numbers, and we have 776. Now, what would 776 seven, seven, mean? I mean, normally we want 777, seven, seven, right? Well, of course, you have to have 776 to proceed to 777. Yeah. And we, we also know that um, in, in the Sunday law, in Ezekiel chapter 8, remember we have 665. Right. Which leads to 666, because that vision is going to continue into the next day. Right. So the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year, even though it starts on the fifth day of the sixth month of the sixth year. So okay. I'm just wondering if, yeah, this 776 is not somehow related to the 777. But, but that's just, again, that, that could be a stretch. When Flip the number. What's that? Flip the number. Flip seven seven six. Six seven seven. Okay. Six seven seven. Isn't that the year that uh, Manasseh went into captivity? Ah. Okay. Okay. So this would be a release from captivity. Yes. Okay. Because it's a mirror. Correct. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that fit within what we're talking about? Yes, it does. And, and of course, it relates to the 2520. Exactly. Right. It's, it gives us a symbol of release from captivity, but it also gives us 
another symbol pointing toward 70 years. Now, does everybody else understand what we're talking about right now? Is anybody else having a problem with this? Is it clear? Well, it, it starts to become clear as you look at the next verses. Okay. So we'll take the next verse. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made before them sport. And they set him between the pillars. So when they're making their hearts merry, the reference was given back to Judges 9.27. And when they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. They're seeing this as a great party, a great reason that they should honor this God of stone, this representation. So is this, when it's being flipped on its head, a message that is causing relief and bringing joy to many within the world. Okay, so so you're saying we, we have this story, the moral story. This is this is the world. This is you know mocking God's people. Right. Right. Now, when we take the ironic story, we're not going to take the Mary and turn it into something negative. Correct. Right? We're going to say that this is good merriment. It's just that the characters here now are representing God's people and the message. Right. Okay. And so when they call for Samson, they would be calling for this message. Right. And now that he may make us sport. I mean, obviously, we're not going to take it in this sort of sense that it's it's here um, to laugh is the one and the other one is to laugh as well just two different forms of the word sakach and tzakach so they're almost the same they're just spelt slightly differently one has a tzadi and one has a shin so they're both uh these sort of s sounds the one has a t with it so i'm not sure why they use these two different words um and and it also has in the second time that he made them sport. It actually has two different words. And the one is the payim, uh, which is the face. So that means they're going to um, laugh in the face. He made them sport. Um, so uh, sport or laugh in front of them, something to that effect. So we would have to take these, though, as positive, right? in in our ironic story we're not going to have it become a mocking because in a sense this is a mocking so we're turning it into a positive thing right right but he set them between the pillars and so what are the pillars well even before we get to the pillars okay the alternate reading is that this was put before the people mm -hmm. now in the ironic way of looking at this when you're putting a a message before the people you're putting something before them for their consideration yeah 
though it still is the word laugh before them. So it's, it's kind of odd how they just um, to laugh right out in merriment or scorn. Okay, so Samson is the message is now being put before the people and they are setting the message between the pillars. And what are the symbols of the pillars? We're not being specific which pillar this is. What is the symbol of all of the pillars? Well, they represent uh, truths. So in other words, the people are now willing to accept the message of the seven times and the interrelation of it with everything else as complete truths. Right. So, so the understanding of the 2520, the seven times, is now going to be set between the pillars, which we have in Adventism. Right. As the truths. We have the foundation and we have the pillars. Pillars being more specific doctrines as such. The foundation being more prophetic message. But there is, but they also are parts of the pillars too. But are the... the the way that I'm looking at this, these are the pillars, not just of Adventism, but of the Millerite message as well. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So these are the pillars. Everything is now set up in its proper place. Samson being placed where he should be. So are the jewels now arranged in the casket in a particular order? using Father Miller's dream. Mm -hmm. That's what it seems like. Does that fit? Mm -hmm. now, now, we're using, we're using, you know, again, oh, yeah. we're using Hebrew numbers to actually aid us in the interpretation of these symbols, right? Right. Which, which is, you know, kind of bizarre. We haven't really done much of that. We have done it occasionally. I'm not saying we haven't. But it becomes almost here a primary way in which to understand these symbols. All right, to understand the story. It becomes a very basic way of being able to understand these symbols, but putting it into verbiage that the that those in the movement would understand and, and be able to explain clearly right and it's something we've already understood we understood that this has to happen right in order for this movement to have any meaning um it has to come together and it has to give a message to the levites right because, I mean, that's the failure of the movement at the present time, is that it's, it's actually not done the work it's supposed to do, either in individual examination and character building, or in our relationships with each other. But especially, we have not given the message to the Levites, right? I mean, we really have been inactive. After the July 18... Um, publication of, of what was going to happen on July 18, on uh, June 21st, June 22nd, those dates there, we don't have, we don't have this movement speaking, you know, publicly for, for to a large degree, especially after July 18. Um, it's almost like we're scared to tell people about things. I mean, we might have a few people talking about the Trump prediction or whatever. But this movement has not generally uh, given a, a strong message. We haven't begun actively working for the Levites in the movement. We've basically just been trying to figure out where we're going. But at some point, we have to come together in order to, to accomplish the work that was given us. And so the setting of them him between the pillars I mean, that would not just be that it's understood, but I think it would be that 
you know, that casket is going to shine. That message is then going to be given. That all the pieces will be put in place that have been examined uh, since the beginning of this movement in 1989. Okay. Now, as we progress, there's a portion from the Spirit of Prophecy that we will read next. As the Philistines exalted over their great victory, they ascribed the honor to their gods, praising them as superior to the God of Israel. The contest, instead of being between Samson and the Philistines, was now between Jehovah and Dagon. And thus the Lord was moved to assert his almighty power and his supreme authority. A favorable opportunity for this was soon presented. The Philistines held a feast in honor of their god, Dagon. A vast company was assembled and in the height of their sacrilegious fest festivities, they ordered the captive to be produced that the people might have a new source of amusement. The multitude greeted his appearance with shouts of triumph and praised their God who had thus subdued the destroyer of their country. Samson had been made the sport of the people before but now even the rulers of the nation mocked at his misery. What does this say to us? I mean, God, th this to me is God having to take the work in his own hands. Hmm. Because how else is he going to assert his almighty power and his supreme authority? Here is the message. The message is being mocked by the people. The message is being mocked also now by the rulers. So you have all of them joining against the message. So you have this huge company that's assembled. They want to make fun of the message. They want to point out how the message has failed. They want to point out that this message is invalid. That the message is not going to happen. There is, from Great Britain, a party that had been part of the message prior to July 18th. This party is very vocal about making fun of Elder Jeff and everything that has gone on prior to July 18th and how the July 18th prediction was a fallacy. This person, this woman, takes great joy in saying, this is not of God. Now, How are we to approach this with, this with this type of understanding? I mean, what Mrs. White is saying here is right in line with what, what we've been reading in the prior verses. How does this help us in our understanding?
Okay. Um, so, so on the moral story, yes. we have people who are mocking the message, is what we're trying to say. Right. Um, and and those ones in in the moral story, uh, they're calling for Samson to come out of the prison house and make sport with him. So so these are those that have turned against um, this movement. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And and we know that this movement is typifying what's going to happen at the end of the world. This right. we refer to with Adventists who turn against. Um, Adventism, who are going to be mocking. Correct. Okay. Now, so, so if we start to take this moral story, um, I mean, we still have symbols that that exist even in the moral story, right? But the pillars, for instance, in the moral story. They're not going to represent God's truths. They're going to represent pillars upon which um, this pagan house stands, right? Correct. And, and what would those pillars be that are going to be taken down by Adventism? I mean, we know what they are, the two pillars. We know the two great pillars that have come forth from paganism into papalism. Right. Sunday sacredness and the state of the dead. Oh, I thought it was immortality of the soul. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. The wrong understanding of the state of the dead, the immortality of the soul. Thank you. Right. Okay. Yeah. So those are the two pillars that are going to be taken down. So in this moral story, Samson is victorious. And Samson, Samson is going to represent Christ in his people. So in the moral story and in the ironic story, Samson is, is victorious. In the moral story, Samson, the person. Yeah. In the ironic story, Samson, the message. Yeah. Is victorious. But Samson, the person, is representing Christ. Right. Right. So, so yeah. So we have a message on the one hand, and which is in the ironic story is victorious. Um, and they're they're both victorious in in the same way. The only thing is in the ironic story, he's not taking down the pillars of. Um, you know, paganism and papalism, right? Um, he's he's establishing the truth. So, so I mean, that's where it becomes difficult here. That that's where I was having trouble trying to turn this story on its head, because we still have to take this as a positive. But the pillars represent two different things here, right? Right. In the two different stories, the temple represents something different in the moral story than it does in the ironic story. So if in the moral story, Samson represents Christ, mm -hmm. in the ironic story, does the message represent the 144,000? Well, well, in both the moral story and the ironic story, I mean, this has to represent the completion of a message. So the one is, in the moral story, it represents Christ, but it also represents Christ, Christ's character in his people in the moral story, right? Because we see that Samson has moved from where he was morally to some other place, right? So he's going to, he's actually learning in this moral story, right? He, he is now depending upon God in the moral story. Right. right. Um, so, I mean, and we could apply this all to Christ. I mean, this could all represent Christ and, and we could make an application of the story of Samson uh, to the cross. Other people have done that. 
but we know we're making an application of of Samson to in the moral story to the first second and third and fourth angel's message and the death of Samson would refer in the moral story uh, to God's people at the end of the world, the 144,000. But they have come out of this, they, they've been transformed in character, because Samson is transformed in character in the moral story. In the ironic story, um, we still have Samson as a message but a message that produces this change of character. So the two stories line, um, si lie side by side. They're not separate stories. They are the same story. But one's representing a message more directly, and the other one's representing uh, people more directly. Would we agree with that? I think I see your point. Mm -hmm. I know, but this is this is not easy thinking. No, no, this is not this is not just something that you can just kind of passively look at. You have to really think about it. But we see in this moral story, we see this development of Samson's character. We see him as we are. We're sinners. Right. We have not done anything that God has asked us to do. That's an understatement. Right. So we're going to have our eyes put out. We're going to be put in prison. Right. And, and this is dealing with the moral aspects of our character until we learn. And that change happens um, in verse 22, when his hair of his head begins to grow after he was shaven. I mean, this is a restoration. That Christ is beginning his character is going to be seen in us. Um, now, of course, it's still a, a terrible story in the sense that Samson, you know, everything that happens to him. But we can see that it is a victory. And it's the victory symbolizing Christ on the cross, but also representing God's people at the end of the world. But the moral story is tied to it. We can't really, or the the symbolic story, the ironic story is tied to this moral story. It is, we're seeing the result of the message. It's the message that actually brings about this change in Samson. It's the gospel, the everlasting gospel, these tests that Samson goes through. Those are the things that are going to change his character. So, so they run, you know, they're on the same track. These are two, two tracks that that lead the that that run parallel. They're not separate. Okay. How do we approach the rest of this? I mean, we're, we've got 10 minutes left in today's study. And the next verse that we're going to come to is going to have a change of subject again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna have this lad or this boy Right. That, that held him by the hand. Right. And suffered right. me to feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean upon them. Um, and it's interesting here that lean um, has all the numbers of the July 18, 2020 symbol. Really? Yeah. 8172. So it's obviously, I mean, you could go the 20th year, the seventh month, the 18th day if you went in reverse. But anyway, we have that um, with the, the name with Rosh as well. 
a, a, an ordering of those numbers. But anyway, the point is uh, we have that with this lean. Um, but okay, now now let's bring up one other point now. Yeah. That we had not we had not previously looked at. So Samson wants to eight one seven two upon the pillars. Yeah. Samson is eight one seven is eight one two three. Okay. So we're talking a difference here of fifty one. Maybe I'm not looking at that right. Sorry. I was reading. I was reading Samson's the the number of Samson's name incorrectly. My fault. Well, eight one two three. Yeah. I was looking at it as if it was eight one seven three. Oh, okay. That's eight one two three. Okay. So the pillars are being looked at as a symbol of July 18th. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so the pillars um, represent, uh, I mean, the messages of Adventists. If he's going to be placed between the pillars, Samson's placed between the pillars, that he may lean upon them. The, the thing that leans, lean being those numbers from July 18, 22, or 2020, I mean, um, also. So um, now also the word feel, 4184, those are the numbers of 1844. Right. Right. Now, in, yeah. Okay, in the chat, the comment is made, Isaiah 11.6, Compared with Judges sixteen twenty six, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf with the young lion, the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. So it's the little child part. Right. Right. So the question is, what is this lad in this story? Right. He said unto the lad that held him by the hand. So why is there a lad leading him by a hand, a child? Well, if we take this literal, the blind man has to have someone lead him. Mm -hmm. So a little child shall lead him. Right. So what does that say about Samson in character? that he has come to the point where he's willing to be led rather than walking of his own understanding. Right. So he's going to be led by this child, and, and he wants to feel the pillars. Now, we know the word feel has all the numbers of 1844 in it, whether that's significant or not. That's huge. But I, I think it would be. Right now, of course, this is rather obscure. We have numbers representing uh, dates and symbols, and they're scrambled. And so, somebody on the outside would just say, "Well, this is ridiculous." Um, I almost think it's ridiculous, but but it's not because it's what we already know, right? So we're not learning something new here. We're just seeing it in a way that we haven't seen it before. We have a lot to consider in this point. I mean, we we are close to the close of our time today. Mm -hmm. We have a lot yet that is just now coming out that we're going to have to return to when we assemble again on Sunday. Yeah, and, and my plan for for next week is we're going to complete Judges 16, and we're going to go through Judges and draw the lines. Okay. So we're going to next week is going to be a lot of drawing because it's going to take us time. I don't think we can even get it done in one week. But we're going to go through each of these stories again. We're going to review Judges, 
and and then take each of these stories, all of these these different um, messages that we have seen in this movement, um, and then try to sort out how these lines fit with what we see. So, so we're going to have to be doing a bit of a review, and then we we when we come to the judges dealing with Samson, again, we're going to have to review this. So I, I figure it'd probably take us about two weeks, but, you know, maybe maybe we can do it more quickly. I don't know. Okay. But it's going to take some time. Anyway, that's all I'm saying. So we're going to start um, sometime next week, depending on how long it takes us to get through the rest of Samson. All right. Now, do we have anyone with any other comments, questions, or concerns from what we have been addressing today? I'm just thinking about uh, Samson being led by a child. Yes. And he had a sort of like a, it just reminds me of Paul. Or Saul at the time when he was uh, blinded in Damascus. Right. Just on the road to Damascus. He was sort of led into the city as well. So just a thought. I don't know if there's a parallel. Wasn't there also a point where it's noted that with Peter that he would be led? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Peter was led. Yeah, when he was blind. So all or no, when when he oh, was Paul. Paul. Paul was led, wasn't he? Paul was led when he was blind. Peter was led when he was old. Right. Yeah. So so we have some other examples of people being led. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we have a lot of other symbols to be able to consider. Okay, so if there are no other comments or questions, shall we close with prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. And we thank you for the revelation of these symbols. We ask, Father, for your direction and your guidance through this day. Help us now, for we need to be led of you. We cannot go forward under our own strength. We need your wisdom, we need your strength, and we need your guidance so that which is done will be according to your character and according to your will. I thank you for each one that has contributed today. I thank you, Father, for those that have attended and for those that will come to view this later. Be with us now so that we may more clearly understand this as we consider it through the day. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.